For many years after its discovery, Pluto was a full-fledged planet alongside its cosmic siblings like Earth and Saturn. However, scientists demoted it to a dwarf planet as it did not meet one of the criteria for being a planet. Despite its demotion, it has retained the interest and research efforts of astronomers and sky watchers. Now, NASA has released stunning images of Pluto. Everyone is in a state of shock after seeing these incredible photographs and they can then provide crucial insight into the secrets of the dwarf planet. What mysteries await discovery in NASA's images of Pluto? Have these remarkable images provided new information on Pluto's intriguing composition and surroundings? Join us as we explore the first real pictures of Pluto that were leaked. Be prepared, they are not what you think. In 1930, an American astronomer named Clyde Tombaugh was working at the Lowell Observatory in Arizona. He was using a 13-inch telescope, which was rather spectacular for its day. Tombaugh wasn't staring idly into the great expanse of space. Rather, he was on a mission to discover a ninth planet. The idea of this imaginary planet was first proposed by Percival Lowell, a well-known astronomer who believed something was out there. Lowell discovered several anomalies in Uranus and Neptune's orbits and hypothesized that they were caused by another planet's gravitational pull. Sadly, Lowell died before he could find out the truth about his hypothesis. But there was no fear of his work getting lost as Tombaugh continued where he stopped. Tombaugh spent endless hours scanning photographic plates two at a time, using a device known as a blink comparator. This mechanism allowed him to switch swiftly between two plates. He would flip between the plates such that if there was a planet on the plates, it would seem to hop back and forth. Tombaugh was not searching for massive bright stars, but rather for tiny shifts that would indicate the presence of a planet. And then, one day, his hard work paid off he noticed a tiny dot moving against a background of fixed stars. That was Pluto! Tom Bohr's discovery of Pluto was a momentous event that captivated attention all across the world. On March 13, 1930, the public was informed of this finding, which ushered in a new era of astronomy. Now, the newly found heavenly body had to be given a name, right? That's when Venetia Catherine Douglas Burney, an English accountant and teacher from England, came into the picture. She is renowned as the first to name the dwarf planet that Clyde Tombaugh found in 1930. She was 11 years old when she proposed the name Pluto after the Roman god of the underworld. It was suitable for a planet on the cold, remote borders of our solar system. In addition to its proper meaning, the name Pluto was a fitting honour for Percival Lowell. If you look closely, you'll notice that the first two letters of Pluto are the initials of Percival Lowell, a fitting tribute to the man who originally proposed the existence of this mysterious ninth planet. Once covered in mystery, Pluto has fascinated scientists since its discovery. This distant celestial entity is in our solar system's Kuiper Belt, a region beyond Neptune's orbit where ice bodies and comets form. Pluto is about 3.6 billion miles from the Sun and 4.67 billion miles from Earth at its furthest point. Its tiny atmosphere mostly contains nitrogen, methane and carbon monoxide, which expands and collapses as it rounds the Sun. It is approximately 1,400 miles wide, or half the breadth of the whole United States. Pluto's five known moons are Charon, the biggest, Nix, Hydra, Kerberos, and Styx. If you're thinking the moon's names sound familiar, you are not wrong. Pluto's five moons are named after various legendary characters from Roman and Greek mythology. Charon is named for the River Styx boatman who ferries souls to the underworld. The name also honors Charon, the wife of discoverer James Christie. Nyx is named for the mother of Charon, who is also the goddess of darkness and night. Hydra is named for the nine-headed serpentine monster that guards the underworld. Kerberos is named after the three-headed dog of Greek mythology, also called Fluffy in the Harry Potter novels. Lastly, 
Styx is named for the mythological river that separates the world of the living from the realm of the dead. This moon system might have been formed by a collision between Pluto and other similarly sized bodies early in the history of the solar system. Charon, the biggest of Pluto's moons, is about half the size of Pluto itself. This makes it the largest satellite relative to the planet it orbits in our solar system. It orbits Pluto at a distance of just 12,200 miles, 19,640 kilometers. For comparison, our moon is 20 times farther away from Earth than Charon from Pluto. A fun fact is that Pluto and Charon are often referred to as a double planet. Charon's orbit around Pluto takes 153 hours, the same time it takes Pluto to complete one rotation. This means Charon neither rises nor sets, but hovers over the same spot on Pluto's surface. The same side of Charon always faces Pluto, a state called tidal locking. Pluto's other four moons are much smaller, less than 100 miles, 160 kilometers wide. They're also irregularly shaped, not spherical like Charon. Unlike many other moons in the solar system, these moons are not tidally locked to Pluto. They all spin and don't keep the same face towards Pluto. Pluto's extreme distance from Earth has made it challenging to take pictures of it. Surprisingly, the first photograph of Pluto was captured prior to its official discovery in 1930. Astronomer Thomas Gill took the first image at Lowell Observatory in 1915 with a 9-inch telescope leased from Swarthmore College. Apart from pictures, astronomers and scientists have devised other methods and ideas for viewing Pluto, both from a distance and up close. In 1964, a man called Gary Flandro was working at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, JPL. Flandro is an American aerospace engineer and professor for the Bowling Chair of Excellence in Space Propulsion, Emeritus, at the University of Tennessee Space Institute. Gary had an ambitious plan that seemed like something out of a science fiction novel. He suggested a voyage named the Grand Tour. Why grand, you may ask? Well, the tour required a spaceship to explore all our solar system's outer planets, including Pluto, which is far and enigmatic. Sounds exciting, right? This Grand Tour idea was only achievable by a rare alignment of the planets in the late 1970s. This alignment would allow a spaceship to travel between planets using a technique known as gravity assist, similar to a cosmic pinball bouncing off the planets. However, as you might expect, such a large-scale undertaking came at a high cost. Thus, despite its grandeur and promise, the Grand Tour was not approved owing to its high costs. However, the Voyager program, which began in 1977, took advantage of this uncommon planetary alignment. Two Voyager probes went on their own execution of the Grand Tour, visiting numerous planets in the outer solar system. Unfortunately, they did not get to Pluto. In July 1978, Pluto's biggest moon, Charon, was revealed. James W. Christie made the finding using the 1.55-metre card strand astrometric reflector at the US Naval Observatory Flagstaff Station in Arizona. Pluto looks like a hazy mass in the centre of this view, with Charon occupying the elongated portion. Christie analysed the long mass and discovered that it was Pluto's large moon. Moving on to the 1980s, Voyager 1 had the possibility of a detour to Pluto. This was after the spacecraft's close encounter with Saturn in 1980. NASA scientists and engineers considered using Saturn's gravity to launch Voyager 1 towards Pluto. It may have been the ideal time to visit Pluto with a flyby as early as March 1986. However, science often involves tough decisions. Rather than aiming for Pluto, the crew determined that a flyby of Titan, Saturn's biggest moon, would be a more useful scientific goal. Titan is unique in our solar system because it has a dense atmosphere and is thought to have lakes of liquid methane and ethane on its surface. So, while the crew's choice ruled out a Pluto flyby, it did open the door for some extraordinary Titan findings. But Pluto was yet to be studied, and some scientists were eager to learn more about it. So, in 1989, a group named Pluto Underground was founded, directed by Alan Stern 
and Fran Bagenal. The group consisted of scientists and engineers who thought Pluto needed more attention. After endless hours spent on letter-writing campaigns, their efforts provided results in 1990. NASA noticed them and the engineers began brainstorming. But before they could proceed, they encountered a major stumbling block to learning more about this mysterious world. They predicted that Pluto's extra-long winter would cause the atmosphere to freeze and fall as snow. To address this, they needed to design a spaceship that was lightweight, swift, and durable enough to reach Pluto's surface. That's when they came up with the brilliant idea for Pluto 350. The 350 refers to the spacecraft's weight in kilograms. The group wanted it to be lightweight so they could send it directly to Pluto. And to get there, they relied on the Titan IV Centaur, a powerful rocket. This beast of a rocket can transport the spaceship to the outermost reaches of our vast solar system. Apart from spaceships, other instruments have helped astronomers to examine Pluto. For example, the advent of the Hubble Space Telescope provided scientists with a more thorough view of Pluto's system. The telescope's first image of Pluto was captured in 1994, and it showed both Pluto and Charon. At the time, it was the sharpest image of Pluto ever taken. In 1996, just a few years later, the Hubble Space Telescope redirected its attention to Pluto to acquire a comprehensive view of the surface. This photograph, taken 66 years after Pluto's discovery, revealed more views of large-scale differences on its surface than any other planet in the solar system except Earth. The picture set the path for the development of the New Horizons spacecraft mission in 2015. But before that, NASA began the groundbreaking program, New Frontiers, in 2001. The program's goal was simple conduct medium-sized expeditions to uncover the mysteries of other worlds. Their first exciting mission was the New Horizons mission, a spacecraft mission designed to explore Pluto, its moons, and the Kuiper Belt. Alan Stern, a very dedicated planetary scientist, led the charge. He was enthusiastic about space exploration and could not wait to get started. But he didn't achieve it alone. He collaborated with other talented people from John Hopkins University, Southwest Research Institute, Bull Aerospace, and NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. On January 19, 2006, something incredible occurred. The New Horizons mission was launched from Florida's Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. The spacecraft's primary goal was to conduct a flyby investigation of Pluto and its moons, resulting in the first close-up photos and data of these distant objects. It was travelling through space at a speed of around 58,000 kilometres per hour. But it wasn't just going through space for leisure. It had a mission to complete. As such, the craft was jam-packed with expensive scientific tools, they had cameras to capture stunning images, spectrometers to analyze Pluto's surface and atmosphere, plasma detectors to monitor the solar wind, dust sensors, and even a radio scientific experiment. Now, the journey to Pluto was long, but New Horizons did not waste any time. Along the trip, it passed by other interesting celestial bodies and gathered lots of useful information. In 2007, it executed a brilliant move by exploiting Jupiter's gravity to accelerate and modify its route. It also examined many asteroids and objects in the Kuiper Belt. Then came July 14, 2015, the day New Horizons got super close to Pluto. I'm talking only 12,500 kilometers away. No other spacecraft had gone that close to Pluto before. And guess what? New Horizons did not stop there. It also examined Pluto's five moons, Charon, Nix, Hydra, Kerberos, and Styx. The photos obtained by New Horizons revealed a great deal of intricacy on the surface. For example, there were ice mountains and frozen plains. The atmosphere was also blue, but there was no covering. Thus, the surface was red. Furthermore, the findings confirmed that Pluto's atmosphere contained nitrogen, methane, and carbon monoxide. Pluto's biggest moon, Charon, had a unique feature, a dark red polar cap. 
Nix and Hydra, two of Pluto's smaller moons, proved to be brilliantly lit. Kerberos was smaller than predicted, while Styx had an unusual form. After exploring Pluto and fulfilling its mission, New Horizons continued the adventure. It journeyed farther into space, entering the Kuiper Belt. Within the vast Kuiper Belt, the New Horizons crew was looking for something special. Arrokoth. Previously known as Ultima Thula, Arrokoth is a trans-Neptunian object found in the Kuiper Belt. On January 1st, 2019, Arrokoth became the most remote and most basic object in the solar system visited by a spacecraft. New Horizons flew over Arrokoth, coming within 3,500 kilometers. That may look like a long distance, but by the calculation of distance in space, it is actually near. So what makes Arrokoth so incredible? Essentially, it's a cosmic time capsule that reveals information about how planets evolved in the early days of our solar system. And it looks like two snowballs stuck together, two lobes made by smaller things coming together over time. And here's the kicker. Arrokoth contains ancient water ice and organic molecules, both of which are necessary for life as we know it. Now, you might be wondering what New Horizons is up to these days. Well, this small space traveler is still out there, exploring the vast unknown. It's currently over 7 billion kilometers away from the sun, yet it's still operational and communicating with us on Earth. And what's even better is that the adventure hasn't ended yet. Scientists have predicted that New Horizons will still be active until at least the mid-2030s. Who knows? We'll be watching. So, what have new images shown about Pluto? Despite its small size, Pluto has its own atmosphere. Despite its thinness, the major component is nitrogen, with trace amounts of carbon monoxide and methane. Interestingly, when Pluto comes closer to the Sun, its atmosphere expands and then freezes into a solid form as it pulls away. Pluto's atmosphere is remarkable because it has a beautiful blue tinge and various layers of clouds. However, the air pressure on Pluto is extremely low, perhaps 100,000 times lower than on Earth. When it comes to severe circumstances, Pluto is one of the coldest planets in our solar system. Its surface temperature may drop to minus 375 to minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit, or around minus 226 to minus 240 degrees Celsius, depending on its distance from the Sun. Now, let's discuss what Pluto is composed of. It's a fascinating combination of rock and water, mostly in the form of ice. Pluto's mass is around two-thirds rock, with the remaining one-third made up of water. It has a density of around 1.9 grams per cubic centimetre, which is almost twice that of water, but less dense than other rocky planets. Its surface resembles a beautiful tapestry of ever-changing environment. Speaking of its environment, there are mountains that reach up into Pluto's thin atmosphere, vast valleys etched into the icy surface, and massive craters that may have formed as a result of cosmic impacts. Pluto's surface is also covered with holes, high cliffs, and intricate ridges. Furthermore, this distant globe contains unique terrains that cannot be found anywhere else in our solar system. Pluto's remarkable characteristics make it a unique and interesting celestial object. Have you seen the famous image of Pluto with an outstanding heart-shaped feature on its surface? The heart-shaped area is known as Tombaugh Regio, after Clyde Tombaugh, the discoverer of Pluto. It is a vast territory, somehow equal to the combined sizes of Texas and Oklahoma. Tombaugh Regio is a fascinating site with stark differences. One side, known as Sputnik Planitia, is smooth and exceptional. It is simply a massive glacier composed of nitrogen ice that flows and swirls owing to convection currents inside the ice. However, the eastern side reveals a different picture. It's rocky and dark, with mountains, craters and valleys that highlight Pluto's dramatic geology. Aside from its breathtaking attraction, the frozen centre of Tombaugh Regio plays a crucial role in forming Pluto's thin atmosphere. Pluto's nitrogen ice transforms as it approaches the Sun. But as Pluto travels away from the Sun, 
the gas condenses back to solid form. This cycle of shifting atmospheric pressure may influence winds and weather patterns on a far planet. Now, let us turn our focus to the region of Pluto's surface that is constantly facing away from Charon. The far side, often known as the black side, does not receive direct sunlight, which makes it appear dark or shadowed. Irrespective of this, it still lightens up to some extent by a soft glow reflected from Charon, also known as Charon shine. The dark side of Pluto reveals a diverse range of terrains and features. In the northern hemisphere, Venera Terra, a region on Pluto's surface, reigns supreme. It is a mountainous continent decorated with countless craters. It provides a glimpse into Pluto's ancient and complex history. Moving southward from Venera Terra, we see another region called Periplanitia. It is a smooth plain composed mainly of volatile ice. This brilliant area might have been modified by glacial or tectonic activity. The third largest equatorial dark area on Pluto is the Kron Macula. It's a reddish black area close to the southern pole. It has a similar resemblance to Cadula Macula and might be discolored by tholins. Tholins are a vast range of organic substances created when basic carbon-containing substances like carbon dioxide, methane or ethane are exposed to solar UV or cosmic ray radiation. These compounds are frequently combined with nitrogen or water. And now that you've learned this, what are your thoughts about Pluto and its pictures? In the coming years, as we continue to learn about Pluto's far-off worlds, what other marvels and mysteries lie ahead for us? Thank you for watching another episode of Voyager. While you are still here, click on the video on your screen to see more mind-blowing videos like this one.